The next question is about challenges and asking generally, what are some of the biggest challenges with providing feedback for students whenever they're learning Mandarin Chinese and how you've overcome them? You know, you talked a lot about the specifics of the challenges. Maybe do you have some anecdotal stories you could share about how you've been able to help students that are struggling? Um, yeah, it's a great question. I think honestly, one of the best things you can do is just talk to your students. And I, and that sounds really simple and really intuitive. And everybody's like, duh, of course you talk to your students, but having conversations with them and seeing, getting a sense for what they think feedback is and why they think you're giving them feedback, even really simple things like to give you all an, uh, an example from, from the feedback research that we know uh, one of the most effective kinds of feedback in oral communication is a recast, right? Which is when someone says something and they make some kind of error and you repeat it back to them without the error. So somebody says, the bottle is in the table. And you say, oh, the bottle's on the table. You don't interrupt the flow of conversation. You don't say, you made a mistake. You don't say, whoa, error in, no, on, right? You don't interrupt anything. You just keep the conversation going. The problem is most humans perceive that as a confirmation, not as a correction. So you say, oh, they say the bottle's in the table and you say the bottle's on the table and they go, yep. And you're waiting for them to like have noticed that you said something different from them and they didn't notice. They're thinking you're just confirming the fact that they already told you. So one thing you can do that is really simple is training students to pay attention to look for that to notice that when you're repeating something that they said back to them, it's often because you're trying to help them be just a little bit better. And that you're not only doing it to them, you're doing it to their peers, right? So that they can be paying attention when you are interacting with them, but it's also gonna happen if they're interacting with more proficient speakers, right? So there's a little bit of sort of feedback literacy, we could call it, that you can build with your students the same way you can build some of those expectations around sort of, I'm not going to give you feedback on everything. And here's why, because it's not realistic. It's also not helpful, right? One of the most impactful sentences I got out of a teacher training a long time ago was teachability, right? The ability to teach something is constrained by learnability. So you can only teach what people can learn. And learnability is constrained by processability. So people can only learn what they can process, and you can only teach what people are ready to learn which is based on what they can process. If you overload them with too much feedback, you, it's as simple as asking them, repeat back to me what I just told you. They can't even remember what you just said, much less sort of incorporate seven different pieces of feedback into their next performance right away. So it's choosing that most important thing, right? That priority, I want you to get this, you got it. Okay, move on. Let's get the next thing, let's get the next thing. And, uh, I think we'll see a lot more steady growth on that kind of realistic path than if we overwhelm students with a bunch of stuff and they just shut down because it's it's too much to process that they can't handle it. Read completely. It is all about what the students are ready for. And again, we seem to keep looping back to the importance of that self-assessment, students being able to give themselves their own feedback, figuring out where they need to keep working. Thank you for that. That was fantastic. We'll go with the next question. This time we'll go ahead and pass to Wang Laoshi. And the question again is about feedback. And the question is, what are some of the biggest challenges with providing feedback for students in learning Mandarin Chinese and how do you overcome those challenges? Um, I think uh, tones uh, is a very uh, unique and uh, um, you know, aspect and sometimes it causes a lot of difficulty for you know students, especially those from English speaking. Uh, background. Um, uh, the Chinese is a tonal language. Uh, so in most of the cases, the mispronunciation does not affect the native speaker's understanding of a non-native speaker. Uh, if a student simply uh, pronounce everything in its flat tone, uh, people understand them. It just sounds like a little robotic, like in this Star Wars, you know, robots, right? But they sound, you know, however, students don't have this awareness. Uh, beginners often think they must pronounce all four tones accurately from day one so they can be understood. That may cause a lot of anxiety and stress to the students and may affect how they, you know, um, continue on learning Chinese. So to give a productive and uh, a practical feedback, I need to know what the students co is concerned about and to address their questions accordingly. 
So therefore, my feedback in the first week is different in the middle of the semester, even when I address you know, the same questions, as my expectation may be different. And the stage of students' learning and performance and their needs may change over time. So at the beginning, I will reduce you know, their stress and the burden by telling them uh, if you, you know you pronounce uh, the initials and the finals correctly, you know you, you after you study you know the audiobook, uh, the pin page on the website, and I think that that's a victory you know for day one. And so great, and you will get an A for you know uh, this day, right? I'll give them a you know an A, even though the tones may not be totally accurate and they may introduce some like an accent. It depends on if they're English speakers and Spanish speakers, they may pronounce you know like a certain um, PE differently. Um, but as long as they are kind of um, on the right track, and I'll give you a, an okay. Uh, you know, I just said the goals as uh, communicable. So if I can understand it. Uh, as a native speaker, that's great. And doesn't have to expect you to be like a native speaker, like a native speaker from day one, right, or week one. Um, so instead of, uh, you know, accuracy at the native level. So however, in the, you know, midterm, uh, I expect them to hold a fluent conversation by mastering the vocabulary expressions of 10 basic conversation topics. So that's a little higher kind of the standard. And it's a little broader, right, uh, what I assess. Uh, by the end of the semester, I expect them to perform fluency and accuracy in pronunciation, yet paragraph learns kind of speech. Uh, so the basic rubric does not really change. So, uh, you know, like uh, the expectations are you need to do, uh, this are the, you know, the categories, right? The fluency, you know, um, the you know appropriateness, you have to be confident, and how to, you know, the speech flow has to be good. You know, there are different categories that you know that has never changed. It's like, you know, across the semester is, you know, the same. But however, how I enforce the rubric and how I evaluate their performance change and how I instructed them, you know, to make progress change. So students know that from day one, even though the uh, expectations uh, may be a little high, but they also know that they have a whole semester to work on it instead of, you know, uh, stressing themselves out, you know, thinking, oh, I can never do this. Um, so that's uh, how, how I kind of address, you know, this question. It is, again, really important to make sure that we as educators are even assessing the right things and then giving feedback on what we're really trying to assess. And there is sort of a filter we kind of have to put our, I think sometimes, at least I can certainly vouch. So sometimes whenever I am grading a paper and I see a student who's particularly struggling, sometimes I have that natural instinct to just go crazy with the pen and give the framework of, you know, this is all just trying to help you. But, you know, it, it takes time, as you said, in day one, you're going to have different expectations than you will versus the middle of the semester versus the end of the semester. So there is kind of that that need to take all those things into consideration and factor all of that in whenever we're giving feedback. So these are all excellent points, good things to think about. Thank you for that. Thank you. I'll go ahead and pass the next question. It's the same question actually to Peng Laoshi. And again, this is about feedback. What are some of the biggest challenges you find whenever you're providing feedback to your students who are learning Mandarin Chinese? And how do you overcome those challenges in this online environment? Uh, yes, so uh, there are two biggest um, challenges I uh, realize in providing feedback. One is effectiveness. We have limited time and energy and attention. So not only from the teacher's perspective, but also from the students. So how, how much time can we allocate for providing feedback for individual students or to the class? And then how much attention students will give to our feedback? So uh, that's the first challenge, um, the effectiveness. So I really like what uh, Galosh mentioned. Uh, I did it in a certain way, but I didn't think it in the Quadrum, you know, 25% uh, from the teacher to individual students to the uh, whole class and then to uh, peer, um, peer feedback or students' uh, self uh, reflection. I think maybe in the uh, upcoming semester, I'll do it more systematically. So that's, a, that's something new I learned today. Uh, I think that's a, that may address this or one of the uh, ways to address this challenge. Uh, of limited uh, resources. Uh, another challenge I noticed is actually um, the difference. Uh, students at different proficiency level need different types of feedback. 
Uh, so Wang Lao Shi mentioned uh, quite a bit uh, at the uh, beginning students in their tones or uh, earlier we talked about the writing, right? So um, are they writing in characters or are they typewriting? So uh, the type of feedback we provide to students also makes a difference. At the intermediate level, so um, what I uh, noticed is students at the um, beginning level, uh, they need a lot of encouragement to maintain a high level of motivation to continue the journey of learning Chinese. Uh, for students at the intermediate level or from intermediate level to advanced level, they need different types of uh, feedback. Uh, it may have to do with learning strategies, uh, may have to do with metacognitive uh, strategies or even the mindset. So um, to students, um, especially uh, I, um, I, I teach uh, advanced level classes uh, in the past uh, uh, few years. So I know this student, in order to uh, encourage students to seek the greatness to achieve superior level proficiency, sometimes they need some advisement um, on how to become a independent learner. So that involves a different type of feedback we provide students. So um, usually I, uh, give students a 45 minute or long or sometimes um, one hour long uh, language advisement session. So that involves the conversation, you know, the uh, deep understanding where they are, how they study, and even sometimes have them study next to me and as observe how they do an exercise or how they read an article, or how they uh, watch a video and come, come up with their uh, summaries, for example. Uh, and then when you sit side by side with the students, you are able to notice more. You are able to um, combining with their, you know, that their work or their uh, performance in class, you're able to provide that in-depth uh, feedback they need for the next level of progress. So that's another way to deal with students' needs at different proficiency levels. Wow, and that is just so, the idea that I'm really hearing, reading through from everyone is that there is that importance of teaching students through feedback to self-assess. And even though you are investing a significant amount of time to sit with students as they study, you're quite literally, the, the old saying is teach a man to fish and he'll eat forever versus just giving a man to fish. You are teaching your students to fish. You're teaching them how to learn. And they can take that knowledge and apply that to those more advanced studies where they really might need the support. But now that they know what they're doing, now that they understand fishing, so to speak, and we're learning essentially, now that they know what to do, they can tackle those more advanced questions. I absolutely love that philosophy and that idea. Thank you for sharing that with us. And Ling Laoshi posted a question back to Kaz Laoshi asking, when you get a chance, can you please elaborate a little bit more on the four quarter feedback approach? Um, if you have a few moments, if we could talk a little bit more about that four quarter approach, I, I really do like that idea and that framework. That's something I think that we could maybe all implement into our school year coming up going forward, if you have a moment. Sure. Yeah. So the basic idea really is just to, there's no sort of set way to do it. In other words, it's not like four in sequence, like you look through the list of formative and summative assessments you're going to do and you say, okay, this one's one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, like that. That's not the idea. And this is, and the, the four quarters, the percentages, again, it's not sort of an exact science. You must do exactly 25% in this way. The idea instead is to look through your assessments. And I find it really helpful actually to like map out the assessments that I'm going to be giving across an entire semester just on like a large piece of chart paper. I actually do it with sticky notes because then I can move them around. Uh, but just to have my like 15 week semester, what kinds of summative assessments am I going to be doing? What kinds of formative assessments am I going to be doing? What are sort of, I heard Wang Lao mention, what are sort of the quizzes? What are things that are kind of smaller than quizzes? What are things that are bigger, like uh, unit level performance assessments? If I have a midterm exam or final exam, if that's a thing in my context, fine, putting them all there. And once you have this map to get a sense of sort of how many times you're assessing your students a little more formally, because actually the secret is we're assessing our students all day, every day, basically everything we do is an assessment, but formal assessment we'll say is looking at those and deciding which ones 
do I plan to give each individual student feedback for? And why? Why do I think this assessment deserves individual feedback? Is it because it's the students have invested a lot of time? It's something like a project. So it really does need that teacher to student sort of individual feedback. Is it that I'm going to across the board say all of my unit level summative assessments will be individual feedback from me to the students? And remember that individual feedback doesn't mean that you have to do different things for every student. Automatic feedback, right? Like if you are having them watch a video and answer some multiple choice questions, that's individual feedback because everybody gets different feedback, right? It doesn't have to be that you write them, you know, 500 word explanation of what you think they did well and they didn't. In fact, I've, I actually have a colleague in the Boston area who he started just collecting sentences that he found himself saying or typing to different students over and over and over again. And he made himself almost like a feedback bank that in his first year doing it, it was a lot of work, right? To like grab these different sentences and kind of compile these lists to say on interpersonal assessments, I seem to keep saying these things. On presentational writing assessments, I keep saying those things. But after he did it year one, it became really fast to give feedback because he could grab those relevant recurring sort of comments and not type them from scratch over and over again. So the idea is just to look at your assessments and say, which ones do I want or need to give one-on-one -on -one feedback for? Which ones can I just give feedback to the whole class for? And there are some nice frameworks to do that, some different possibilities there. Which ones can I train students, because it does take training, to give feedback to their peers on. So that might look like the students listen to a performance by a peer, or they read something that a peer wrote, or they watch a video that a peer made, something like that, right? You have to think about what's the thing that they're gonna give feedback on and which ones can they give self-assessed feedback on? And what does that look like, right? Are you gonna make a self-assessment like a Google form that they press, you know, I usually do, I can't do this yet, I can do this with help. I can do this independently, right? They have kind of these three choices for each of the things that they're self-assessing on. Is it that you're using a rubric that they already know how to use, right? So it really is just about planning in advance how you're gonna give feedback. We always have an assessment plan, but we don't usually have a feedback plan. And I think that's where we end up, like Paul was just talking about, we spend a lot of our time because we're not thinking carefully about it in advance. We just think, oh, I'm building them up. I'm doing all this teaching planning, right? I put the assessment there, backward design all the way through the unit, and I'm teaching towards this really nicely designed assessment. But I never actually thought, what am I going to do when I get to the assessment? What am I going to do post-assessment. And because we don't plan for that, then we typically don't ensure that our students are going to use the feedback. And there sort of is this disconnect, right? We have this really nice buildup all the way to the assessment, and then it kind of falls flat. And then we do another unit and it kind of falls flat. And there's not this connected sense that the students are bringing stuff with them from unit to unit and feedback kind of being that link. So what it boils down to for me, whether you like 25%, fine, 50%, fine, 30%, it doesn't matter. The point really, I think, is to think and to plan to have sort of a feedback plan when you have an assessment plan. And then that feedback is not only how will I give it, but if you have a really nice feedback plan, it's how will they use it? So I, I'm going to give individual feedback, and then I'm going to give all my students an opportunity to revise their essay, for example. Because if you say, I'm gonna spend all this time giving individual feedback, and then I'm gonna cross my fingers and hope that the students use it, they won't. So you have, so it's planning these things really intentionally, I think is, is the goal. And it, it, to be honest, it's something I'm still really working on in my own practice. It's really hard to plan for all of these things because it feels like a lot of work up front. But I'm finding that if I plan for it, I'm much more likely to save myself a lot of work throughout the semester and not be giving individual feedback on everything because I can't. Otherwise I stay up till 3 a.m. every day and that's not healthy. Yeah, definitely not healthy. And I would agree that there's definitely that uh, medium where we kind of have to be diligent about, are we working hard or are we working smart? You made a comment about the uh, colleague that you have up in Boston that was saving the feedback. I do this. 
And I actually used this with a text expander tool and I am so well trained now. I'm at the point where I can key in characters that to other people look like random shorthand, but it will come up with an entire blurb and point them to a resource, a link. To, and I maybe I made it or it's something that somebody already made, but this explains what's going on with that it. So it's been a huge time saver. And I love that the students are able to get that instant feedback from me and that they can go out to whatever website and they can see more in detail what's going on. This is fantastic. 